Hallelujah. 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 Glory be to God. Welcome to Breath of Power. This is the place of God's presence, the altar of God's fire. I am expecting a mighty move of God today, and I'm inviting you to come and join us in this hour of receiving from above the great and mighty things that God has for his people in this very hour. I want to encourage you, bring all your friends, bring all your people, send the messages out to people on your contact and ask them to join us because our fellowship is with God and with the Holy Spirit. Now it's time for us to ask our minstrel to take us into God's presence. Our dear brother, Dari Lijuka, take us into God's presence to worship. I know who I am Cause I know who you are The cross of salvation Was only the star Now I am chosen Free and forgiven I have a future And it's worth the living Cause I wasn't made to be Tending a grave I was called by name Born and raised back to life again I was made for more Okay. 
Sing it over yourself. So I would I make bear my shame with a fountain of grace. It's running my way, I know I am yours. I was made for more. Yeah. Hallelujah. I was made for more. What a song. God wants us to reach out for the greatest, for the best in our lives. And that's why God has called us together in this breath of power to empower us, to breathe on us his breath, to ignite us, to liberate us from fear, from bondage, from poverty, from whatever draws us back so that we can reach out for the best. We are going on in a series of teaching on Living at the tops, living our life for the best. And uh, last week we started we, we started um, a session on the need for diligence. And we are wrapping up that particular subtopic today, the need for diligence. Why we need to be diligent in order to rise to the tops and be the best. So come along with us. And let's trust God that today God is going to do something special in our lives. I'm taking my text from the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, reading verses 19 to 23. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Proverbs, chapter 23, reading verses 19 to 23. He said, my child, listen and be wise. Keep your heart on the right course. Do not carouse with drunkards or feast with gluttons, for they are on their way to poverty. And too much sleep clothes them in rags. Listen to your father who gave you life, and don't despise your mother when she's old. Get the truth and never sell it. Also get wisdom, discipline, and good judgment. God just plays it out so clearly and so well for us here. Get the truth and never sell it. Also get wisdom, discipline, and good judgment. God wants us to listen and be wise. The reason many people are not living at the best of their lives is because they are not listening. God wants you to live a good life and prosper in every aspect of your life, spirit, soul, and body. He's interested in your well-being. Little wonder he created man in prosperity. God himself is resourceful. But he doesn't toil. He works smart. And that's why he never gets weary. And that's how he wants us to be. Not toiling but always working smart, being diligent. And that will take us to the tops. This week, the Lord made us to understand that grace is good, but we must not sit on grace if we want to become great. We mustn't sit on grace. We should rather leverage on grace through diligence, and they will become great. What was the story, the testimony of Abraham and his descendants? That's why because God blessed them, but they didn't just get lazy, sit down, enjoying the blessings. They worked hard. They worked smart. They leveraged on the grace and the covenant blessings God gave them. And they prospered abundantly. Today, God, we want to unravel it unto us some truths, deep truths about diligence. I reveal to all that diligence is the springboard for prosperity and greatness. We must listen to these truths that God is going to bring out to us 
because they are going to catapult us to prominence and prosperity. And we'll only have ourselves to blame if we fail to listen. Because when you don't listen to these instructions, you will go down in poverty. But I believe that that will not be your portion. The first thing I want to bring out to us is that we should understand that righteousness does not always lead to riches. It's not true that once you give your life to the Lord, you get born again, then you begin to prosper. That's not true. Because there are many people that are prosperous, they love the Lord, but they are not prospering. There are principles of prosperity and greatness. The grace of God and the righteousness of God will provide us the opportunity, give us the grace. But we have to leverage on the grace of God through the principles that pertain to prosperity. That's how we will be the best of what God wants us to be. Those who know and work in these principles are wise. And when they do, it's God's people. They will become righteous and rich. There are some people that are righteous and poor. Somebody was telling me, I remember when we were in the university, was telling me that he said he didn't want to be rich because if he's rich, he's going to forget God. I told him that that's not what I understood from the word of God. And I want to be rich, but I will want to serve God. Then he said, ah, it, the, the Bible tells us about the story of the poor man, Lazarus. He was poor and he met, he met heaven. He made it. Then I asked him, when Lazarus got there, who did he find? He found Abraham. Indeed, he was sitting on, a, on Abraham's bosom. Abraham was already balanced well in heaven. And Lazarus was sitting on his bosom to be comforted. I told him, I don't want to go to heaven like Lazarus. I would prefer to go to heaven like Abraham. No. Did Lazarus take along with him when he went to when he went to when he went to paradise? He couldn't even get the rich man he was feeding, he was eating uh, in the front of his house. The Bible didn't tell us whether he had a wife, whether he had children, or whether he took them along if he had them. The Bible tells us about Abraham, it tells us about his children. Little about his, his, the nation that came out of him. To the extent that even today, all believers in Christ Jesus are children of Abraham by faith. I would prefer to go to heaven like Abraham than to go like Lazarus. And that's the truth that comes with the principles of prosperity, which we need to embrace. The passage we read tells us about the words of the wise king Solomon. In verse 19 of that Proverbs 23, King Solomon says, Listen and be wise. It's about paying attention to the principles of life that lead to prosperity and greatness that you make it. You need to listen. Some of us, we keep living our lives without listening to instructions. We make arguments, we give excuses. Let me tell you this. Excuses and arguments don't bring success. What brings success is principles that are fulfilled and observed. And he goes on, he said, keep your heart in the right course. Keep your heart in the right course. It is where you keep your heart that determines how far and how well you will go in life. If you, if you keep your heart in the right path, you will prosper. If you keep it in the wrong path, you will end up frustrated and poor. Many people are keeping their hearts in the wrong path. They are not listening to instructions. And there are many theories out there that 
make some people to so exalt poverty that some people desire poverty for themselves. And some people think that, that poverty is the will of God for them. It's, it's what you believe. Unfortunately, I will tell you, <laughs> your life will be filled with frustrations and with misery. But if you become intentional in understanding the principles of greatness and prosperity, which is God's design for his people, then you will see that your life will turn around. You need to be intentional. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. He was intentional about his spiritual devotion. And that's why he prospered. God gifted him with great wisdom and lifted him to greatness in Babylon. You need to be intentional in pursuing these principles. They will give you success. That's why, as we share today, ask yourself, what is lacking in my life? What should I work on? And by the time we begin to work on these things in our lives, we will see ourselves being tuned into the frequency of prosperity and greatness. Verse 20 says, it's about those people who are lousy, indulging in reckless habits. He said, do not carols with drunkards or feet with gluttons, for they are on their way to poverty. And too much sleep close them in rags. It does not matter the grace of God, the favor of God, or the blessings of God that's on your life. If you are lousy and reckless, you will squander those opportunities and you will end up frustrated and poor. Sit clearly high the face. Some heart lifestyles, habits, and indulgences will raise the red flag for poverty. You must avoid them if you're determined to prosper. This lousy lifestyle, over drinking, over eating, over enjoyment, over sleeping, all these lousy lifestyles. These are weaknesses and moral flaws that will prevent you from working smart and rising to greatness. Proverbs 23, 20 and 21. Do not mix with wine by bibers or with glutons, glutonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the gluton will come to poverty. And drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. It's the same word. When you live this lifestyle or you associate with people that live the same kind of lifestyle, then you'll be contaminated. Remember what happened? A man, a good, fine Christian, and I mean, he had a weakness of drinking at a time in his life, but he quit. Very fine. When he got a job and uh, Many of the people that were working with him, it was in the auto industry, it was there. Many of them were living lousy, drinking, smoking. At first, he was disciplined. But when he hung around with them for a while, he lost it. And it, it affected his life negatively, affected, affected his family, affected his marriage negatively. May that not be our story. The passage highlights idleness and laziness as harbingers of poverty. Once a person is lazy, gives himself to idleness, just know that poverty is around the corner. It's coming. Proverbs chapter 6, 9 to 11. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hand to sleep, so shall your poverty come on you like a prowler. And your need 
like an armed man. It's unfortunate. Proverbs 13, 4, say the soul of a lazy man desires and have nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. People of God, life is not about wishes. They say if wishes are gold. So life is not about wishes. You can wish whatever you want to wish. But if your life is lazy, if you're lazy in your life, those wishes will just be like wind. They will just pass away and you will be where you are. God wants us to commit ourselves to pursue diligence. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4. He who has a slack hand becomes poor. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. You need to learn to be diligent. You need to learn to work smart. Let's just say a hard worker. Because a hard worker may be testing. But if you are working smart, you may be working hard, but working smart. You're making the right effort. Sometimes you may sweat, but not toil. Toiling is a friend and an acquaintance of, of poverty. When a person is toiling, he is operating on a diminishing return. It's just a matter of time. The toll will behave on him and he will end up poor. So it's not about toiling. Walking like an elephant that eating like an ant. May that not be your portion. Life is about working smart. Using your wisdom to know what is right for yourself. Know the easiest and the best way and most effective way to do whatever is in your hand and you will see that your life will blossom. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 4. The lazy man will plow, will not plow because of winter. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. If you live by begging, you're poor. Even if you think you make a lot of money through the begging, some people all think that. You know, happened to some people. We even see it in the church. They will go to this brother and say, Oh, I don't have transport money. Please help me. The person gives you transport money. You go to the person will go to another sister and say, ah, since this morning I'm not eating. I didn't don't even have any money to go home as I'm here. I came here by faith. You get something. Then when he feels that he has deceived those people, collected some money from them, then you know that the money will run out. And then you need by the time you go two or three times, the people will know your secrets. And then you will feel yourself with shame. Let's imbibe the discipline that promotes hard work and diligence, working smart, making the best of our lives, and we'll see that our life will blossom. It may take a while, but definitely you'll be on a course, on a path that will take you to greatness. And poverty comes when you give in to lousy lifestyle. And overlook the red flag of indulgence and bad habits. These habits gradually eat you up and cripple, cripple you until they beat you down and impoverish you. Some overspending, some being too generous. No, the Bible said, don't be over righteous. We need to understand that. That's being smart. I mean, you give, you're doing business, and then because you want to help people, you give and even give the capital that you are using to run your business. You give it away. Then you have nothing. You can't run the business. Then you won't even have enough to give to the people again. Some buy a lot of luxurious things to show that, oh, I'm blessed, I'm prosperous. Then they, they are running a lot of expenses. They cannot 
fully effectively carry. People make commitments that they can't keep up to. The kind of credit card debts miss the payment deadlines. It says see one ton lifestyle. All these will expose you. And then some other people, they do their own lusting, flirting, lewdness, lasciviousness, worldliness. These are things that, you know, when you have filth, it's an open invitation to flies. These are things that bring your life onto the influence of demonic spirits. By the time they weigh in on your life, you begin to see that your life is empty. And the enemy harasses you. Your life is not stable. Your mind is not stable. These are the things that take people to depression. And then people begin to go into misery, into poverty. May that not be your portion. Frivolity. Being unserious. Rather than being serious in life and sensible, you do stupid things. Thinking that some people just get into a lot of things that they fall into the hand of dupes. And that's what God is warning us. Proverbs 28 verse 18. He who tells his lamb will have plenty of bread. But he who follows frivolity will have Poverty enough. So don't say that the word of God doesn't give you enough warning. God has already paved the path of greatness and, of, and prosperity for us. We should follow it. Follow it at God's pace for you. My pace may be different from your own, but follow your own at God's pace for you. You will get there. But when you want to break the, the line, look for shortcuts, then you run into problems. The Bible makes it clear in the passage where it said, diligence is the truth you should get and not sell. Get diligence. Don't sell it. And he asks there in the passage where we read, he says also, Get wisdom, get discipline, get good judgment. He's talking about working smart, living smart. That is what takes you to the zenith of your destiny. And I believe that God is going to bring this into our lives. God shows us clearly from the, from the scriptures. Listening to instructions, listening to God's word, paying more attention to what God is telling us. The principles of life is not after reading the word, seeing the truth, you go back and continue the way that you've been living. But receiving transformation it brings. That's what changes your attitude and brings the attitude and lifestyle of Poverty down and gets it defeated. Diligence will defeat poverty in your life. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 11. He who tills his land will be satisfied with bread. But he who follows frivolity is devoid of understanding. Proverbs 14, 23. In all labor there is profit. But idle chatter leads only to poverty. Proverbs chapter 21. But it's 5 and 17. He said, the plan of diligence leads surely to plenty. Diligence will defeat poverty in your life. Just understand that. You'll be wrestling with poverty. Determine not to be poor again. Follow the path of diligence. The Bible says, it will surely lead to plenty. But those of everyone who is hasty, surely to poverty. If you will not follow things according to rules, 
according to standards, you are only digging ditches for yourself. It may seem to work for a few times. Then you fall into the ditch and you lose everything. He who loves pleasure will be a poor man. But who, he who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Proverbs 21, verse 5 and 7, 17. But you have all the things, too, that the scripture teaches that will help you defeat poverty. The Bible talks about generosity. This is how to work against poverty and defeat it. Proverbs 11, 24, 25. There's one who scatters, yet increases more. There is one who withholds more than is right. But it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich. And he who waters will be watered himself. Learn to be generous. Generous in your giving to God. Generous in your giving to people around you. It is when you sow, you reap. This life. You need this in your life. Prosperity is a blessing you should desire and receive. God himself wants us to be rich. He wants us to prosper. And it's what we should understand. Prosperity is a mark of strength and success. Prosperity shows that, yes, there is strength in your life. It's a mark of success. Proverbs 22, verse 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. So where do you want to be? You want to be a borrower? I prefer to be a lender. You want to be poor? I prefer to be rich. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 15. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. The word of God is clear. And I believe that the word that God is showing us today should make us to make a vow in our hearts never to be poor again after hearing this word. And if you make a vow, such a vow to God, and you determine to commit yourself to it, you will not see poverty again. And he said, it is the life I live. I don't know what I don't know what poverty means. It's a long time I left the name of poverty. I used to be very poor, living from hand to mouth. I mean, in those days in Nigeria, I may have five naira. I'll be believing that I'll be able to spend the whole day without spending the money. Indeed, I had an incident when money was still money. I had ten naira, and uh, I was in a meeting, and a brother came to me, and I was pleading with me, say, please, please, can you, can you help me with five, five naira? And I was like, hmm, I know that I had 10 naira, but my faith, I gave him five naira. And soon after, I saw the brother drinking some drink, soda, with the five naira, and you know, in my heart, I was sad because I knew that I couldn't afford to go and drink that soda with that five naira. It was precious money to me. I gave it to a brother, and the brother was using it to drink soda. I was sad. That was because of poverty. God has forgiven me and delivered me from that life. Don't live that kind of life anymore. Because I'm determined to be diligent. No matter what, no matter the challenges I have, it's not about giving excuses why you failed. It is about getting reasons to succeed. Psalm 35, verse 25, 27, reading in Amplified Version. Say, let them shout for joy and rejoice. Who favor my vindication? I want what is right for me. Let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. Who delights and takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants? This word is right for me. This is the scripture. What the word of God is saying. This is what is right for me. I want you to claim it as what is right for you to prosper. Because God delights and takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. When you are prospering, God is happy. God is joyful. 
When you're not prospering, God is sad. It's human that God will forsake you. God doesn't hate the poor. Indeed, God helps the poor. He loves the poor. But God hates poverty. And that's why God will always want anyone around help the poor. He wants to help the poor. But it's not so that he will remain poor, so that he keep on getting help. It's so that he can come out of poverty. If you also want prosperity, you should want it in the right way. Because riches could be a snare to entrap you and make you a servant of the devil. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, for which so has strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It's not about the lot of love of money. Love of money is evil, it's of the devil. If you love worldly things, love the things of the world, Satan will ensnare you and destroy you. Oh, Satan even used it. He tempted to use it against Jesus. Showed him all the glory of the world, the beauty of the world, the wealth of the world. And he told Jesus, just in a snap, if you can just bow, even if you just bend a little bit of your head and bow to me, I will give you all this. He said, because they've been given to me. Satan has enough riches to buy anyone is available for him. But it is for you to make yourself unavailable. It's about your heart. It's where your heart is. That's where your treasure. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. There was a problem with Lot. Lot was one of the rare stories of a man we saw in scriptures who was righteous but ended off poor. Righteous. Lot was known as a righteous man, but he ended up poor because he loved riches. He loved riches. He loved money. He loved worldly riches, and that swayed him from the path of the covenant. He started well when he came, was growing up with Abraham. He followed Abraham, his uncle. He started well. He was prospering. He became rich. And when money came, he got carried away. You know, the problem is that some people cannot handle success. Some people cannot handle prosperity. So when prosperity comes, it's wasted. Now what happened to him? He lost the godly vision, which he shared with his uncle Abraham as they came into the promised land. And he was carried away by the worldly vision of Sodom. The riches that are immersed in corruption, immorality, and perversion. And where did he end up? He ended up losing everything. Indeed, I remember the story when the angel came to deliver him. Delivered him from the destruction. And the angel told him, he said, wrong run to the mountain, escape to the mountain so you will be safe from the destruction. Lot was so lousy. He began to complain. He said, I can't, I can't get up to the mountain. I'll be tired on the way and I will, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I will die. I mean, if an angel of God with you tells you to escape to the mountain, you thought that when he told you to escape to the mountain that God will not give you the strength and grace to climb up there. We keep getting excuses to remain poor and remain low and remain defeated. And then the angel just spared him and then said, okay, go to where you want. He entered into the God's permissive will. And because of him, the angels spared that particular part of the plane where he was going. But that couldn't still save him. He couldn't stay a long time in the place because the life of the people were so corrupt. And where did Lot end up? He ended up in a cave as a loner with his two daughters. 
And one time, the daughters played on him, got him drunk. What a lousy man. The daughters got him drunk and uh, had sexual intercourse with him and produced bastard children. And those children became rebellious nations against the people of Israel, the covenant people of God. So these are the stories of people that live a lousy life, people that don't follow God's standard of righteousness, and they do by worldly standard. It will not be well for them. Poverty is a curse. It's not good for you. It doesn't mean you should fear poverty. It means you should hate it and always walk against it. The, work, the way to walk against poverty, to live a life of diligence, live a life of righteousness, live a life of right judgment, live a life of discipline, live a life of generosity. But if you live a life of laziness and lousiness, or stay in the company of people who do it, and you are not working smart, you'll be drowned. Poverty is not a virtue to desire. It's not what you should exalt or promote. It's not good. God hates poverty and God wants us to come out of it. Poverty degrades a person. You should hate poverty. It degrades a person. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24. The hand of the diligent will rule but the lazy man will be put to forced labor. Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Where do you want to be? Ecclesiastes chapter 9, 14 to 16. There was a little city with few men in it. And the great king came against it and besieged it and built great snares around it. Now, there was found in it a poor wise man. And he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet, no one remembered that same poor man. Then I said, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised. And his words are not heard. I don't want to be poor. Poverty is a reproach. If you are there, do your best to come out. Don't let your wisdom and strength and your beauty be despised and be trashed. Poverty could rubbish a person and turn his strength into weakness, turn his beauty into shame. That will not be your portion. Poverty is a sign that you are a failure in life. It's a proof that you are defeated by the negative forces of this world. Proverbs chapter 24, 30 to 34. He went to the field of a, of, a, of, a, of a lazy man, and by the vineyard of the void of the man void of understanding, and there I saw all overgrown with thorns. His surface was covered with nestles. His stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber. A little folding of the hands to rest. So, yes, sir, your poverty can come like a prowler. And your need like an arm. The negative forces of life, they are the things that work against the lazy people. And they drown the person. These negative forces of life were released on the earth when man sinned. They were released as a curse. The man was driven out of the garden of Eden to go and toil. Genesis chapter 3, 17 to 19. Then Adam, then to Adam, he said, the Lord said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and had eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. This is the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Big tongues and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herd of the field in the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread 
till you return to the ground. For out of it were you taken. For thus you are, and thus you shall return. So it's, it's a curse taken as a result of a curse that came out of man's failure in the garden. Genesis 3.23, Therefore the Lord sent him out of the garden of Eden to fill the ground from which he was taken. Filling the ground. He's toiling. The continent of poverty is not toiling because toiling is a component of poverty. If you're living a life toiling, you need to be delivered. You need to be free. Moses warned the people of Israel that poverty and toiling is a misery. It's a word that, came, that, that, that comes as a result of the curse for the sin of disobedience. And that cripples people's life and makes them to end in misery and doom. Deuteronomy chapter 28, 15 to 19. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, your God, to observe carefully his commandment and his statutes, which I command you today, that these causes will come upon you and overtake you. What shall you be in the city? What shall you be in the country? What shall you be in your basket? And then your kneading brow, how shall be the fruit of your, of your body, the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle, and the offering of your flocks? Shall you be when you go out? How shall you be when you come in? These are the causes that come with disobedience. It shouldn't be in your life. Matthew 23 and 24 says, And your hands which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be iron. And the Lord will change the rain in your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. It's toiling. Toiling will waste you away. And it's still a curse. You don't need this in your life. These negative causes, uh, forces are moving around and hunting for souls. And so many people are crippled in life. And they are under bondage. They are strongholds in their life. I want us to understand that poverty is also a spirit. There's a spirit of poverty. Poverty can bring a satanic stronghold in someone's life and completely frustrate and destroy the person's life. There are people that have been designed for greatness, blessed in life, but at the time they began to go down and go down, crippled by the spirit of poverty, everything in their life collapses. There are things it takes a fight, a spiritual fight to defeat poverty and the things that bring misery in your life. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. I have fought with poverty, the spirit of poverty in my life. I will dream, I will be seeing myself when I was young, going back to school to take exam, and every time, it's either my pen is not writing, or I didn't see the paper, I didn't understand anything, Somehow, somehow, by the time the exam is, people are submitting the paper, I'm not reading anything. I woke up and wonder what's happening to me. It's a spirit of poverty. Some people, they are growing, they are making progress in life, but when they go, they dream, they will see themselves frustrated, ragged, naked. Those spirits of poverty, they are real. But you know what? They can be defeated when we stand in the spirit and fight. Ephesians 6 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Child of God, let to fight. He doesn't want you to make progress. So don't give excuses and give reasons why you are failing. Give up and fight. There are some of us. What you need is to cry for help. For deliverance. Sometimes this is what we bring some of us out of trouble. First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 7. Verses 7 and 8. In the Amplified Version. The Bible says, Jabez 
was more honorable than his brothers. But his mother named him Jabez, saying, because you get back to him in pain. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you will bless me indeed, and enlarge my borders, my property, and that your hand will be with me, and you will keep me from evil, so that it does not hurt me. And God granted his request. This young man was born out of sorrow. You know, the Bible said it was more honorable. That's the way the Bible started the, 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 the story. But you know, <laughs> it's like didn't start with honor. His life started with misery, with shame. Because his mother had probably when he was born. They labeled that on him. He carried the label of shame and poverty on him. But one day, he just got tired. And I, I will say, got angry with that poverty. It's like that some of us get so angry. And then he, the only person who can believe, deliver him. The Almighty God. The Bible says he cried out to God. Deliver me. There are some of us that need some kind of praise. You know, such so, so this kind of prayers, you don't pray them openly in church because many of us in church we play the love prayers. You play the prayer that your neighbor will be comfortable. There are some things you don't deal with openly in church, except under the anointing, where you lose control. There are some things that you need to get to the house, close the door. It should be you and God, nobody else listening. You tell God exactly how it is. You tell to him, tell Lord, deliver me. I remember when I had that ministry. It was my first year in university. I just gave my life to Christ. And then I was under a lot of misery. Especially a lot of nightmares. I couldn't sleep. And I was a lot of things. Poverty too. Because of my faith. At the time, my father, who didn't understand about my faith, he withdrew income coming to me. I didn't have money. I didn't have peace. I couldn't sleep. When I go to study, as I want to study, I will be falling asleep. I will hardly be able to concentrate for more than 15 minutes in my study. My life was like getting to a wreck. One day, I just went to my room, locked the door. I, I wept like a baby. Tell me, help me, deliver me. And I'm going to tell you, brethren, that was the, the last time I prayed on that matter like that. Because I witnessed freedom. I may need fasting and praying. If that's what it takes, do it. Now, some of us, it we need, get to a truly anointed man of God to lay hands on you and minister to you. And sometimes, he need the spirit. That's it's what sometimes it takes. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, 7, it shall come to pass in the day. Then his back shall be taken away from his shoulder, and his yoke from his neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. Sometimes we need the anointing to break the yokes in order to restore our lives. And that's what God is saying. People of God, the Lord is speaking to us. It was the same pattern with the early disciples. They took this seriously. The early disciple took this man seriously. Seriously, Paul spoke. He said, For even when, 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 10 to 12, even when we were with you, we commanded you this if anyone will not walk, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you disorderly, not walking at all. There are busy bodies, not in the force who are such. We command and exhort. To our Lord Jesus Christ, but they walk in quietness and eat their own bread. It was a serious matter to the early disciples, and it's a serious matter to us today. In verses 13 to 15 of the same Second Thessalonians 3, he said, But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, make that person and do not keep company with him. He may be ashamed. 
Yeah, do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. It was a serious matter in the body of Christ. It's still a serious matter today. We should be committed to diligence in order to succeed. Timothy, he wrote in 1 Timothy 5, 8, he said that if one does not provide for his own, and especially for those his, of his household, he has denied the faith that is worse than an unbeliever. So that is the word of God coming from Apostle Paul. And the thing he did is that we should develop a culture of diligence, a culture of diligence. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 10 to 12. And indeed, you do so towards all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that you may work properly towards those who are outside, that you may lack nothing. A future of diligence. Let him who stole steal no longer. Ephesians 4.12. 428. Let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his own hand what is good, that he may have something to give to him who have need. This is the shift that God wants us to establish. A culture of diligence. A culture of diligence. And I want to wrap up with this. The economic principle that Joseph provided that Egypt from drought and turned the whole nation into a global economic power was the result of diligence raging on God's revelation. When Joseph spoke to Pharaoh and said, this is what we need in the years of prosperity, let us save. Let us work hard. There's a lot of seed that we are going to store. Do it, store it, so that when the years of famine comes, we'll have prosperity. This was what raised Egypt. Because they worked hard. It's not just that they got the revelation. Some people may have gotten the, the revelation and gone to sleep. They will have still ended poor. But with the wisdom, the Jesus that came, that followed that revelation, they stored up great store. And they had abundance when famine came. And that is what made Egypt one of the first world powers. The world, a global power at that time. God will grant that to us and turn around our financial destiny in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for you. That the past will deliver you from everything about shame, about poverty, about misery, about woe. But there will be a curse in your life that have been holding you down. And the Spirit of God will come upon you and breathe on you the breath of diligence. In the name of Jesus, I release that upon you. If you lay your hand upon the prosper, we bring them around you. God will bring peace in your life. A decree and decree and God will open for you great doors. We are going to sleep on those doors. We are going to leverage on those doors and rise to greatness. We begin to live a life that will impact our world to the glory of God. May today be the last day of life and poverty in your life. It is the beginning of great things that will cause you to flourish, flourish abundantly to the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I want to tell you congratulations. If you have received this word and believed it, congratulations. Because you are rising to the tops and you are going to remain at the tops, going from glory to glory. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, brethren. God bless you. I want you also now to give, give, give generously, give generously. Give generously. Purpose in your heart to give, to support this work. And God will abundantly bless you. Those that scatter in faith, they give generously to God's kingdom and also to other charity work. 
But within, especially to God's kingdom, God will bless and prosper you. And I pray for you. You will never have any lack. This season will be a season of abundance. We're already coming towards the end of the year. You are not going to end this year weak. You are going to end this year in great strength and with great joy, overflowing with the blessings of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I want to also say a big thank you to everyone who came in on board today. Thank you to all of you who came in to join us. The Lord will bless you. The Lord will abundantly prosper you 